Hey. Off. Hallelujah. If you have a Bible, go with me to the book of James, chapter 3. James, chapter 3. And we started a new series a couple of weeks ago just called Seeds and what God is wanting to really show us and really impart into us that we, and I'm going to really plant this in, pardon the pun, but I'm going to plant this in of how important it is that we know that we were not created to divide, to subtract. We were created to multiply. We were created to produce something. We were created so that God uses us so that we do something for Him. And we are coming into a time and to an age like never before where God is looking at His people and saying, what will you do for me? Can you hear me? What will you do for the Lord? Will you be obedient to whatever He's called you to do? Because it's time that we, like my wife eloquently said, that we rise up. And we take our position that we are not just, you know, keeping a seat warm. This is just a time that we're worshiping corporately. We're hearing from God's word. But as soon as we leave here, we're entering the mission field. We're doing the work of the kingdom. We're evangelizing. We're inviting people to church. We're, we're doing something for the Lord. We're interceding. We're praying. We're we're a part of the family of God so that we are activated. And we don't just take what the Word is and we let it go in one ear and out the other, but we're allowing it to land on good ground. And we're saying, God, I want to change. I want a difference in my life. You know, for a long time, you know, I've just been, just been saying in my own life, Lord, I, I just I want to know you more. I want to know you more. And and it just has been on me and, you know, all through January, actually. But then I'm, I just decided, no, I've got to get up and pray. I've got to seek God. I want to be more, more like God and I want to be with him more. But then so many times, so many distractions come up and things come up. And then I, you know, I get, you know, despondent. I feel guilty, not really, you know. But it's up to me. It's up to you. Say, I'm not really satisfied with where I'm at with the Lord. I want to grow in God. I want more of Him. Amen? Amen. And so we need to really ask ourselves, ask the Lord, Lord, show me, what do I need to do? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, but also it says that we are to be doers of the Word. Not just hearing, but actively doing the Word. And so this morning, I want to ask you a question rhetorically. As I ask that, and I get the answer back, but you just think about it. <laughs> you answer it to yourself. But what kind of harvest do you want? What are you after in your life? And I'm only telling you this of, of you know, because... I tell you, every morning I was like, Lord Jesus, you got to wake me up. you got to help me. And I'm so glad that the Lord is, okay, I'll wake you up. I didn't even need an alarm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, then I really know revival's coming. And every time I, I would walk, walk to the church, walk where I go to pray, every morning I was like, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Because I beat the, the sleepy, you know, the sand man. I, I got up and, it, man. But if I want a relationship and I want to grow in God, then I got to make some changes in my life. And the harvest that I want for me, just talking about me, is that I want to be closer to God. I want His presence, not just on Sunday morning, but every day. I want to feel Him. I want to hear Him. I want to know when God whispers. He doesn't have to shout for my attention to be held. He could just whisper. And he, He's grabbed my attention instantaneously. 
See, I want to be so in tune with the Holy Spirit and what God is saying that at a drop of a hat, I'll be like, yes, Lord, I'll, I'll do that. But in order to have that harvest in my life, then there are certain seeds that I got to plant. Certain things that I need to do in order to get what I want. But what do you want out of life? What are you after? Are you happy with the, the status quo, the same old same, the, you know, no difference, it is what it is? Or are you after something? What do you want out of this year? If you were to look as we're in the beginning of this year yet, of what do you want 2020 to be like? You know, I, I, I want to travel more. Friday, believe it or not, I could have been on my way back to Israel. I want to I want to go places this year. I want to do things. I want this year to be the most incredible year of my life. I want this year to be our greatest married life. I want this year to be a year of financial freedom. I mean, what do you want this year? Maybe we need to just sit down and write some this is what I want this year. Maybe we need to plan out, you know, specifically, what do we want this year? What are you intentionally going after? What are you intentionally going after? And are you intentional about going after what you want? You know, I mean, people get a little touchy about this subject, but everybody says, oh, I need to lose weight. And then they're in line for an Mm-hmm. I don't know you, but mm, you can. Mm. <laughs> okay. But if you want something in life, you got to be intentional about it. If you want a growing God, you got to be intentional about that. It is amazing how people go through so many problems, so much stuff they're going through, and yet they're never at church. And yet, if they would come to the house of the Lord, if they would be with the body, if they would pray, if they would hear from God, we said it last week, it could just be one moment and your whole perspective changes. Things can, can happen miraculously. You don't know who could be at church. You don't, know what could, you don't know what God could deposit in you. But you'll miss it because you want this pity party you want a solo party. You want everything to just come your way when you're not willing. Oh, I could preach. And usually things don't just drop in your lap, do they? You got to decide every day. Now, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we might serve the Lord. No, we will serve the Lord. There was intentionality about Joshua. No matter what was going on, as for me and my house, this is what we're going to do. And so many times we are just in this complacent American Christian ideology that everything is just going to come to us. Everything is just going to land on us. And we don't have to do anything about it. But God is saying, no, you got to go after it. You got to press in. You got to you got to activate your faith. You've got to make certain decisions. Oh, I'm always depressed. Oh, yeah. Well, who are you hanging around with? You know, if all your friends are all depressed, then turn to your neighbor and say, so will you be. We got to understand who we're hanging around with. What are we feeding on? What are we, what are, what's impacting us? And if we say, oh man, I, I got to change that. Then you got to understand who you're hanging around with. You got to understand what TV shows you're watching. You know, we get hung up on, on binge watching different murder shows. I don't know why, but we do. And then after a while, it's like, oh, this is too depressing. We got to watch Sesame Street or something like, but you know what I'm saying? You know? What are you watching? What are you feeding on? What are you intentional about? 
We make decisions based on what we want to see happen. You know, if you want to see finances line up, if you want to see your marriage line up, if you want to see different things happening in your life, then you've got to be intentional about that. You've got to make hard decisions sometimes. Maybe you brew coffee at home instead of going. Maybe you got to do certain things so that you are intentionally responding to a desire that you want to see happen. Does that make sense? What's the message? James chapter 3, I love this new version. A few of you are getting turned on to it too. It's the Passion Translation. It says in James 3.18, Good seeds of wisdom's fruit will be planted with peaceful acts by those who cherish making peace. Let me read that again. Good seeds of wisdom's fruit will be planted with peaceful acts by those who cherish making peace. This morning I want to talk about two different harvests or two different things that we, we want to go after. And I'm speaking for you. And I hope you're after this too. What are they? Wisdom and righteousness. I don't know about you, but as I grow older, I don't want just my age to determine my wisdom. I want wisdom to go beyond my age. I want the wisdom of God in dealing with certain situations and the wisdom of God where I know exactly how to answer that situation. We were watching a, a murder show last night, and well, actually, it was a, a kidnapping show. How about that? And there was a woman who her daughter was kidnapped. It was an amazing story, and know, I'm sure you know about it. And she went on to a, a certain TV show, and there was a psychic there who said that her daughter was already gone. And she began to believe that word to the point where her heart was literally crushed, and they even believed that she died of a broken heart. Wouldn't you know that her daughter was still alive, and they finally found her and rescued her. My point of saying all that is to really understand who are we listening to? What are we believing? What are we putting our eyes on? What are we listening to each and every day? Are we responding to what God is saying or to what other people are saying about a situation? I want the wisdom of the Lord. I want to know what God is saying so that I could speak and not some random, hyper, weird, super natural kind of craziness. And let me say this. Be careful who you're mixing with Jesus. Let me say that again. Be careful who you're mixing with Jesus. Jesus is not like Buddha. He's not like Krishna. He's not, not like this or that. He's not on the same level as any other so-called deity. He is God and God alone. I said He is God and God alone. I remember this story years ago of a pastor who was doing a funeral. And the funeral home was trying to be ecumenical and pleasing everybody. And they had a picture of, of Buddha and Muhammad and Krishna and Jesus. All on the same level on the wall. Just to please everybody. And the thought was, he is not like anyone else. They're all dead and buried. Jesus was dead, buried, but rose again. He is the only one who rose from the dead. And he is greater than any other concoction that man could come up with. And his wisdom is what we need. We need the wisdom of the Lord. What is wisdom? The quality of having experience, knowledge, good judgment, and the quality of just being wise. Have you ever been around someone like this? Where you just can ask them anything and they'll know exactly what to say or do? When I was a kid, I never thought my dad was wise. You just don't think that your father has anything. You know, your your parents, they can't even turn the phone on. But the older I get, the more I realize how wise my my father is. Able to speak into any situation. And growing up as a kid, I thought, yeah, that's crazy. 
But now that I ask him something and I think about what he's saying, I'm, man, he's right on. I want that right on. I want the wisdom of God. I want to be able to discern what God is saying and what he's doing. And well, I don't know about you. I know that mistakes are good and they teach you and train you, but not that wisdom keeps you out of making mistakes, but even when you're in a mistake, you can have the wisdom of God to net. Na- is that making sense? You're navigating and understanding how how to how to work through this. You see, I want the wisdom of the Lord as I'm raising three kids and wisdom of God of being a husband, wisdom as I'm pastoring, wisdom as I'm I'm doing different things. I want the wisdom of God. And James says here, the fruit, the fruit is, yes, amen. That is no problem to me at all. Or family. The fruit is wisdom. But the seeds... James says, are good seeds planted with peace. So I want to tell you today, the first way that you can have the wisdom of God is by sowing seeds of peace. Do you realize that every time that you are in a conflict or you're in a situation where you could be sowing words of discourse, words of hatred, words of of division, that that's not wise. But wisdom is sowing seeds of peace. Turn to your neighbor and say, be careful of what you sow. I want to be one who sows seeds of peace. Because that, as James is saying, is bringing up the fruit of wisdom. Listen to these verses. Proverbs 1 7 says, Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 2 6 and 7 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. Proverbs 3 7, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Proverbs 3 13, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, all her wisdom paths are peace. Proverbs 4 7, The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. You want wisdom in your life? You want to be more wise in the things of God? Then go after it. And how do we go after it? James says, start sowing seeds of peace. Peaceful acts. Peaceful acts. What are we after? We're after the wisdom of God. How do we get it? By sowing seeds of peace. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are what? The peacemakers. For they will be called what? Sons of God. How amazing this is. But as I tell you all the... Ten years now I've been saying this. Read your Bible what? Slowly. Because James says, If you love making peace, I've got a question for you. It's another rhetorical question. Do you love making peace? I've come to find out there are people that don't like peace. Everywhere they go, they're doing nothing but creating war after war after war. And it's usually a war of the words. They're just wanting to let everybody have it. Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Turn to your neighbor and say, check your heart. If all you're doing is walking around just sowing words of war, then you've got a war going on inside of you. You're always trying to bring in division and wars and rumors of wars. (laughs) I also wrote down that somehow there are people who are more comforted by chaos than living peace-filled lives. They have a, a sort of deficit when there's peace. They can't handle silence. They can't handle peace. So then what do they do? They go and make war because that's where somehow they're comforted by that. 
Let me tell you something. We need the peace of God. We're living in such a chaotic world, and I'm telling you, it's only going to get worse. There's only going to be more wars, more earthquakes, more tsunamis, more economic breakdowns, more racial dividing. How do you know that? Oh, yeah, I read it in the Bible. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get any better until all of a sudden the Antichrist is going to come and say, peace, 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 and it's all going to be false. We need to have peace in our hearts. We need to be able to respond to this chaotic world with peace. But I wrote down that peace has a price, doesn't it? If you love making peace, then you also love losing battles. Your peace is based on how much you love making peace. So here are some traits. You need to be humble. Humility is something that we joke about it, but it's funny how you could pray for peace and somehow instantaneously God will answer that prayer request. He'll either make you trip in front of people or something, you know, you'll spill your coffee all down your blouse or something will happen and, and he'll just, okay, you asked for humility. Here it is. We also need to be teachable. And there's a lot of people that aren't willing to be teachable. That aren't willing to say, you know, Lord, you're trying to show me something, teach me something. It may even be through someone that you know God has placed in your life, but you're just not willing to be teachable. How about this? You got to love not getting your way. So many times it's all about me. It's all about me, Jesus. You got to have your opinion spoken. You got to win the argument. You got to have your way. But when you love making peace, you got to be willing to say, Not my will, but your will be done. I don't need to win this argument in order for peace to come. I don't need to say all the, the things that are over somebody's head so that they, you know, no. I also wrote down, it's not being selfish, but serving others, preferring others. If we want to really love making peace, just as we're saying here, what is the harvest? The harvest is wisdom. Some of the wisest things you could do is keep your mouth shut. And be quiet. And be still. And let God fight your battles. Let God take care of that situation. We all know if you've been following the Lord any amount of time, that if you allow God to intervene and do what He wants to do, He'll do it much better than you ever will. You're the one who will mess it up. You're the one who will get emotional and be outrageous and letting your argument and your words fly. But then you allow God to move. Oh, he can do things like no one else can. We got to let God fight some battles. In fact, we got to let him fight all our battles. We got to let him do whatever he needs to do and just be wise about things. Not not interact with people quickly and and just process things and pray through things and ask God, "How do I how do I handle this, Lord?" Trust me, he'll give you wisdom. Because the end result is that we're after wisdom. And how do we get that? Through peace. Sowing peace wherever we go. Blessed are the peacemakers. I want that to be, you know, my life's, you know, thing. To always be producing peace. To be wherever I'm at, sowing peace into people's lives. Not being a part of the argument. Not being a part of the... And it's not to say that you let confrontations go by you. There are things that you have to stand up to, but you do it in a peaceful way. I said you do it in a peaceful way. There's a process to this. There's always a production line. There's always a a cause and effect. I love how... 
A.R. Bernard says, change is not an event, change is a process. And you may say, well, you know, I want the wisdom of God, but I don't always know how to to bring peace to a situation. That's okay. We're going to fail. But as long as we're a part of the process of saying, Lord, I want your peace in my life. I want to sow peace wherever I go because this I'm trying to get your mind to wrap around. What do I want in my life? I want wisdom. And what are the seeds that we sow to get wisdom is to sow peace. But it's a process that we're in. That we decide every day that I'm going to be a person who sows peace wherever I go. Amen? This whole thing about cause and effect is very interesting because Paul writes in Romans 5, 3 through 3 and 4, very interesting. He says, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. What is the end result? Hope. But how do we get hope? By suffering. There's some more seeds that we need to give. And that's by just allowing sometimes to suffer. We don't want to suffer, do we? We don't want to go through the vice. We don't want to go through the fire. We don't want to go through the tension. But when you know that God is at work and there's a process in your life and He's after something in you, He's after something in me, He wants us to become more like Him. I should have gotten a big amen there. I heard somebody say, let's make amen great again. Just put that on the shelf. We need to know that we are in a process of becoming more like Christ. And if it's so that we become people full of the wisdom of God by sowing seeds of peace, then that's what we're going to do. It's a process. Just as Paul is writing that hope is a process, so is wisdom. So is what, what we're after. It is a process. It's something that we got to say, Lord, if I failed this time, I know you're working in my life. A few months ago, our local grocery store, Pioneer, was, I mean, for years now, it had been like no food on the shelves. Then you go in and there's some food. We're like, what is going on? You know, like you go in and there's one can of sardines and that's it like what is going on and then then we found out that somebody bought the store and well they've been redoing it and putting in food how about that and then they changed all the aisles over the bread used to be in aisle one now it's in five and you're like your head is spinning every time like where is the beef but there's something that I, I really have been thinking about. Because the other day they took off the Pioneer sign and they put up a Met Food sign. But what's funny is that, that they didn't paint the exterior of the building it, in the shadow of where the old sign was. It still says Pioneer, but over that is Met Food. And I don't know about you, but there's still an imprint of sin in my life. There's still an imprint of, of work in progress. But there's a stamp over it that says the redeemed of the Lord. And that God is the owner, the new owner. He's the, the new manager. He's in control of my life. And there might be some things that i got to process through yet. Maybe some things that i got to you know think about before responding. But I'm a work in progress and so are you. And so if your bread is still in aisle five when it should be in aisle one, then just let God continue His work. This verse has been in my heart all day, all week rather. He who began a good work shall complete it. Thank God for that. He will complete it. But what am I after? The wisdom of God. And how do I get the wisdom of God? By sowing seeds of peace. Here's the second harvest. Righteousness. Or it says in the ESV version in James 3.18, 
and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What's interesting is that it's one seed, but two harvests. One seed, two harvests. One seed, two harvests. Isn't God amazing? One seed, two harvests. One is wisdom. One is righteousness. How do we get them? Peace. It's amazing when you think about what you can get out of one seed. What is righteousness? Righteousness is just having a right standing with God. There's a second definition. State of him who is as he ought to be. The state of him who ought to be. The third is the condition acceptable to God. Proverbs eleven eighteen says, The wicked earns deceptive wages, but one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. Isaiah 32, 17 says, And the effect of righteousness will be peace. How about that? And the result of righteousness, quietness and trust. I think it's worth re- repeating that verse. Isaiah thirty-two seventeen, And the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness and trust. When you are aligned with God, there's peace. And maybe you saw it years ago. It's a play on words. But no peace, N-O, Peace, N O Jesus. But K N O W peace, no peace, K N O W Jesus. The whole idea is when I'm aligned with God, there might be chaotic situations coming up, but because I'm aligned with Him, I've got peace that passes all. understanding. I don't understand how in the middle of this storm I sleep well at night. In the middle of all the the words and chaos peace like a river just flowing in my life. I could be, you know, susceptible to fear and trembling and Doubt and sleepless nights and, oh my God, what am I going to do? But then when I align myself and say, God, you know exactly what's going on. I just need to tap into your peace. Because when we're rightly aligned with God, there is peace. So you have to ask yourself, how much peace do I have in my life? And then ask yourself, how much Jesus do I have in my life? Because the barometer is, if you don't have as much peace as you know you could have, well then, you don't have as much Jesus as you should have. And I'm not saying that all your problems go away, and we all win the Powerball, <laughs> And we all have everything that we desire. That's all superficial. Peace does not come because you have so much in the bank. Peace doesn't come because your car is running. Peace doesn't come because everybody likes you. Peace comes because I'm aligned. I'm plugged in to Him. And no matter what I'm going through, as long as I keep my eyes on Him, And I align myself to Him. How do I do that? By being in His Word. By seeking His face. By being intentional. God, you know all these things that are going on, but I have decided I'm going to plug into You. It's funny how we are so, you know, it's just crazy how technology has all of the, the bad like tentacles of it. One of them, just thinking now, is not in my notes, but just one of them right now is that we're always making sure that our phones are what? 
charged up. <laughs> and oh, the panic when it comes down to red. Oh, Jesus, what are we going to do? What if we were that way with our walk with God? What if we, we were just very cognizant and aware of our power supply? That instead of some stupid phone making sure that we could like something. I mean, our right thumb should be so, you know, right? It should be like all pumped up, you know, like the right one should be like, I'm all pumped. Oh, I'm weak, you know, because I'm playing. But it's like all we do is stroll. And then, oh, man, I don't have any power on the phone. And we look. At, where, where's the power? Oh, there, there's one. Henry, there's one. One, one over there. Have you seen that funny thing? These people did it in an airport. They put a sticker, a sticker on the wall of a of a power plug of an outlet. And people are going to the sticker trying to plug in. We do that in the spiritual. It's a facade we're trying to plug in, we're trying to plug into something that. You can't even get the prongs into the wall. You can't even, there's not even a source, but we're just trying everything we can. Maybe this, maybe this way, maybe this way. Now just plug into Jesus. Just say, Lord, I need you. I need to spend time with you, time with your word, time of alignment where I hear from you because then I know that no matter what comes my way, as Psalm 91 says, as long as I'm hidden under you, as long as I'm under you, that nothing will come near me. That I'll see a thousand fall at my right, ten thousand at my left, but nothing will come near me. Why? Because I'm plugged in to the peace power source. I'm plugged into the one who gives me joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm plugged into the one who gives me wisdom because I'm doing my part of sowing seeds of peace wherever I go. One seed, two harvests. Righteousness and wisdom. But I have to give the word in, in not just one side or biased. Because righteousness is not just my, my, you know, as long as I do this. Paul said we cannot have any righteousness if we have no faith in God. He made it clear in Romans 3.22, the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus. And I'm telling you, and maybe you're, you haven't been close with the Lord for a while, or maybe you're tight with Him, it doesn't matter. Where's your faith? May our faith always be in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's the answer. He's our hope. He's our peace. He's our joy. He's our all in all. But the greatest effect of us sowing seeds of peace is wisdom and righteousness. Father, I thank you for your word today. Lord, I pray that, God, we would have a, a clarity and understanding that, God, if we're after more righteousness and we're after more wisdom, that, God, you would enable us to sow seeds of peace. And it might even be in, in natural relationships where we could be very quick to argue or respond in a fleshly way. But God, I pray that by the Holy Spirit You would remind us to sow seeds of peace. Lord, I pray that as we said that it's a process and sometimes we'll win and sometimes we'll fail, but God, we are a work in progress. And I pray, Lord God, that we would come to an understanding that, Lord, when we do our part and we sow seeds of peace, just as James said, that we will reap a harvest of wisdom and righteousness. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here in the sound of my voice that does not have a right standing with God, 
Lord, your word says that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we'll be saved. And it begins by just having faith in you. And Lord, if there's anyone here that would just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. I want to have a right standing, a good standing with God. Lord, we want a right standing with you because we have a reverence and a fear of you. We want to follow you. We want to be a, a disciple of Christ. We want to, we want to walk in your in your footsteps, Lord. Lord, so many times we fail, but God, I pray that you would you'd remind us of the, the pioneer grocery store. Lord, it's a process. And you'll help us. Lord, that we would always remember that there's a stamp of redeemed over the past. That, Lord, everything has been washed away and we are new creations in Christ. And I pray, Lord God, that, that we would just get plugged into you. Help us to make concerted effort to be intentional. And I want to spend more time with you. Whatever that looks like, help us, Lord. Help us to be in your word more and to be students of the word. To pray and seek you and just be with you. I pray for everyone here today. That God, you would touch every heart, every life. I pray, Lord God, that as we go throughout this week, that we'd be very attuned to your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would protect, watch over, and keep us. I pray that we would be on fire for God, sold out, radical, and standing up for the truth, sowing seeds of peace, reaping a harvest of wisdom and righteousness. And I bless your church today, God. I bless them, Lord, with the strength and knowledge of God. I bless them, Lord, with the peace that passes all understanding when the fight comes home, that they would have peace. I pray, Lord God, that every situation that we're facing, Lord, Externally, internally, we would know that, God, you've got this. And the battle is yours. I pray, Lord God, that as we go, that you would bless us. May the favor of God be upon us. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for coming.